think we have the question we're going to ask them to repeat it back so that everyone learns in a good time. Okay, just waiting for the thumbs up. Do we think? Yeah. Thumbs up. Okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for those who've joined us, and thanks for everybody who's joined us online. Um, so my name is Duncan Brown. I work in IT services, and I head a team called Digital Innovation and Application Development, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we're a team that builds a lot of the bespoke web and mobile applications that you use at the university. Um, but we also do get involved in innovative technologies. And I am here today to give you the very first demonstration, a bit of a world premiere, of our new AI, AI power chatbot, which has been built 100% in-house uh, by my team today. So hopefully you're all expecting to see this. Uh, sorry, can I get that? Are you working? I think it's, there we go. Okay, so the agenda is going to be quite simple today. I think I've got an hour for the slot, but I'm not going to take up anywhere near that much time. Um, split it into three parts. So first of all, I am going to show you a little bit about the architecture. Um, it'll be slightly technical, so some people may not be interested in the technical side of things too much. It won't go too deep, don't worry. But for those who are interested in how we have built this and the various pieces that are powering it, you're going to get to see a little bit behind the curtain um, and see exactly how it works. The second part of the presentation, I will do a very short, simple demo to show you the chatbot in action and show you some of the features um, that we built into it. And then I'm going to talk about the next steps and how each of you might work with us in the future moving forward um, so that we can provide the AI-powered chatbot to various different areas of the university. Um, there'll hopefully be plenty of time at the end for the questions. If you've got something you desperately want to know about, Rob, I believe you're monitoring the chat, so do shout out, feel free to enter into the chat. Um, and I'll do my best to answer the questions. Anything that is very technical, hands up, I've not built this bot, uh, the team have, I can always take it away and come back to you with um, a more accurate answer, but I will, I will try my best. Okay, the one question we get asked all the time is why would we want to use a chat bot? Um, so I just want to touch on this just so everyone's clear of our agenda. We're building it, our primary goal creating the AI powered chatbot is initially to provide an online assistance which our students can access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the chatbot ensures that no matter the time or the place, the students can get help should they need it, uh, even outside staff working hours, which is normally when students do need assistance. Uh, we find, so we do regularly meet with the various student cohorts. Uh, they constantly tell us that navigating our university resources can be quite overwhelming for them. There is an awful lot out there, teaching and non-teaching materials. Uh, our aim is to provide this chatbot and to simplify the process. So it will provide a straightforward way to access the correct information that the student's looking for. Um, first time, every time, you know, we want to make sure we give them the accurate answers as, as soon as they search and then not having to go to various different uh, places online to try and find their answer. Uh, the chatbot will provide automated responses to the frequently asked questions. This in turn does reduce the workload of our service desk staff across the university, and that should leave them more time to address the more complex inquiries um, that the AI chatbot won't, isn't aimed to handle. And naturally being a digital innovation team within IT services, we wanted to embrace modern solutions to improve campus life. So this chatbot does represent our commitment to using those emerging technologies to enhance the overall student experience. Okay, um, some challenges with building an AI chatbot. I don't know if anyone's had experience with this, but um, I just wanna run through some of the challenges that we did face um, with developing this. First of all, we need to design the bot so that it accurately understands and responds to a wide variety of queries and intents. This has been one of our biggest challenges and one which requires quite sophisticated natural language processing. And that's where the AI piece of this puzzle comes in. It also needs to seamlessly integrate with our existing databases and all our various information systems that we have um, across the university in order to provide accurate responses. So what we can't do is spend a considerable amount of time and effort 
reconstructing and rewriting our existing databases and our existing knowledge bases. That would take up far too much time. So we need a way to interpret that data appropriately to provide the suitable responses the chatbot will give every single time. Uh, we also need to ensure the information provided by the chatbot is up to date and it's accurate um, and relevant to what is being asked. Uh, so we need a mechanism for continuous updates and verification on the data to always be taking place. Um, and it's also essential that the chatbot is limited to only answer university specific questions and topics. Uh, what we never set out to do was create a general purpose AI chatbot that can answer any question in the world. Uh, ChatGPT have already beaten us to that. So we'll allow them to carry on doing that. Um, but yeah, so it needs to be specific and accurate to what we need. And we also need to avoid consuming too much of the AI components and resources uh, in order to keep the costs to a limit. And when I show you the architecture, I'll show you how we are able to do that. Okay, these are the technologies, the solutions that we are using to power the chatbot. So starting from left to right, we've got our chat uh, widget, which is uh, live chat. So we already use this on um, some of our mobile applications and online on the web. Uh, but this platform provides the user interface that allows that real-time communication to take place between the students and the chatbot. It is very easy for us to integrate it into our existing web pages, our web applications, and our mobile apps. And I will touch on some of the features of uh, the live chat widget when we come to the demo to show you why we have chosen it. Um, the next piece is our .NET framework. So my team, we're a .NET um, studio. Uh, we've used the framework to build the backbone of the chatbot service. It handles all of the complex logic and the data communication between each of the platforms. And we use it for our APIs and connect into the university databases. Okay, moving along, we've got Dialogflow. If you're not aware of this, this is a tool that's made by Google. And for now, we use it exclusively for managing what we call small talk. So small talk um, allows the chatbot to respond to conversations like greetings or some gratitude. So if a student says hello or thank you, we don't need to use AI to respond. Um, we can just use a dialogue flow engine for that, but makes it far more human, far more human interact interaction. Um, next, OpenAI. So we use the language models developed by OpenAI um, to handle all of the complex natural language processing. Uh, and this allows the chatbot to both understand and provide natural human responses. So the, you know, the ultimate goal is you don't believe you're chatting to a chatbot, you are chatting to a person. That's, that's what we're doing there. And finally, the final piece is a system called Pinecone, which is a vector database that helps us manage, search, retrieve information quickly and efficiently. It is the knowledge base for the chatbot. Uh, it provides the power we need to quickly find specific information from a massive amount of data. And there is the uh, live chat widget, which you will get to see very shortly. Right, this is the slide, which is the technical slide. Uh, don't be too put off. Uh, the diagram shows that it's the comprehensive architecture of the chatbot system for those who are interested in how we've put all this together. Please don't be put off if you're not technical. It is actually very, very simple. Um, let me explain each part of the process. All of the processes and the channels that you see here are controlled by our custom-built .NET uh, chat service. But what I'm going to do is start on the left-hand side. The current iteration of the chatbot we are we have built and we are showing today is powered by the My Liverpool oh, FAQ man. system. So My Liverpool is the current student mobile app, and it will be the student web portal, uh, which goes live towards the end of October. So this database essentially contains what we know as frequently asked questions. So questions and answers repeated. So what happens is this database is taken in its entirety. We embed it using the Open, AP, open AI Embedding API. Uh, and that can view, converts the FAQ data into vector formats for us. So we then store this vector data in the Pinecone database. And these vectors 
or used for matching questions with relevant answers. Simple as that. It just allows high speed return of answers when you've got a massive amount of data. Moving on to the widget, that's the, um, the live chat that the student's interacting with. So the students will send their chat session through live chat, and which is integrated onto a website or an app, mobile or web. And the student's messages are sent directly to the live chat um, system. What we do initially is we pass the message uh, by passing it to Dialogflow to determine the nature of the query. So Dialogflow looks to see if the message falls into one of those small talk categories and it handles the response if it is. So some examples, as I mentioned, it could be, how are you? When we've uh, given this uh, chat to some people to start testing, they do start asking personal questions like, how old is it and where is it from? Because they want to see you know, how, how human a behavior it uh, responds with. Um, we can also respond to emojis. So if you just give it a thumbs up or a smiley face, it, it knows that in intent and it can respond accordingly. And then um, we can make it a little bit cheeky if we want as well. So that's what we're doing with the fine tuning, but uh, we can also hand provide multiple different responses to that same input. So this is quite key. So if you've got a decent chat session going and you say thanks more than once, you don't want to get the same response back. So very rarely will someone respond identically each time to you. So we can give it multiple messages just to really enhance that experience. Okay, hopefully you're still with me. If there is no small talk, the input data is converted directly into that vector using the OpenAI embedding API. It's a bit of a mouthful, that one. And then we use that vector to search against our um, FAQ vectors, which are in the Pinecone database to find the most relevant match. And if Pinecone successfully identifies the relevant FAQ, then the answer to the question is included as context in a prompt to the OpenAI completion API. So this API gives a much more natural human response with the data provided from the database and will reference the context of the question to make it appear much more conversational. So hopefully I will show you what I mean by, by that in the demo, but I want you to really pay attention to the fact that it will use the context of the question and previous questions when forming its answer to make it appear like it's a, a natural human conversation taking place. So hopefully no questions on that one. And um, actually it's quite straightforward really. Uh, the last point, and this goes on to uh, making sure all our responses are accurate and up to date. So if you've ever used a knowledge base and you've searched for something and the response is out of date, it, it's worthless, it's useless to you and the experience is, is wholly negative. So we've created a solution as part of this whole framework to make sure all our responses are accurate and what we are providing back to the students um, is up to date. That is the key to su the success of this platform. So we've got what we call a vector updater. Uh, it's basically a trigger which runs on a scheduled task on um, the servers, which automates the maintenance process for us. So we don't have to get involved. It's, it's fully automated. So again, using modern tech, uh, it connects to the FAQ database. It connects to the Pinecone database. It compares all of the entries based on their last modified timestamps and it will automatically add, update, delete, amend the vector data in our Pinecone database as needed. So the beauty is if you do want to update um, some information in the system, you don't need to speak to us, you'll be able to do it directly through the knowledge base and all the backend will update itself on a regular scheduled task. And again, just to stress, this is um, the widget itself, uh, it's a user-friendly interface, so it's quite standard. This is one of the leading um, chatbot widgets on the market. I want to be clear, though, we've done no design work on the widget whatsoever so far. That's still to come. Uh, this is very much out-of-the-box experience uh, when it comes to the user interface. So before it goes live, it will get a fresh lick of paint. And we're even just talking about giving it a name, so we've not come up with a good name for it yet. So if you want to personalize it and humanize it even more. So if anybody listening has got any good ideas for what we should name it, please, please let me know. Um, but yeah, one of the main reasons for choosing live chat as well as, well as um, we already have experience with it. 
is that we can add it to all our web apps, all our websites, all our internet, intranet sites, mobile apps as needed using the same single code base. So we can just lift and shift and put it elsewhere and we can have as many instances of the chatbot running across all the different platforms as we need. Some other uh, features I can touch on, we can drop the chatbot into a live agent session if we need. So we currently do this for welcome week. We have uh, many staff who are there for the first four weeks or so of uh, the new academic year, and they can interact with uh, students in real time. So they can sit at their desk and answer the questions. Uh, what can happen as well is um, agents can monitor what the chatbot is doing, how it's performing, and can step in if they need. So it can immediately drop to a human. It doesn't have to solely rely on the, the AI. Um, what you can also do as an agent is you can monitor multiple chats are happening at the same time. So if you've got a, a, a subject specialism, you can see what's coming in from the different students. Um, and again, just this simple uh, image here, but I will show it in the demo, is very much showing that the chatbot is understanding the previous question and the context of the question and, and the dialogue that's happening and continuing on that subject matter. Okay, that's enough talking for me, I think. Do you wanna have a look at the demo? More fun, isn't it? So because this is only using the My Liverpool FAQ systems currently, I'm just gonna to touch on four areas. So library, student service, student administration, and IT services. I was hoping to have another screen because I've got the questions set up um, to save me typing, but um, I might just copy and paste if that's okay. So you'll see the questions before I type them in. What I'll do uh, is hopefully I can make it a little bit larger. This is what the chatbot looks like out of the box. Um, my team used to be called AppDev, so we just called it AppDev um, for that. But as a start of a turn, it will ask me, you know, how may I help you chat now? So currently we've got no authentication process um, integrated in the demo. We are building this now so that if, for example, we place the chatbot onto the new student portal, if a student has already logged into the portal, we can pick up that authentication and we can already log you into the chatbot. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more because that is where the real power of the chatbot comes in. For now, what I'll do is, if I move my phone out of the way, I'll just type my name and I'll give it my email address and I'll hit start chat. Okay, how may I help you? So, and now quickly I can type, when is the library open? So this is where you get a little bit nervous and your heart starts beating a bit faster when you start doing a live chat, a live demo, sorry. There we go, when is the library open? So what it's done, it's gone through, it's found the information, nothing too um, exciting there. But what if I was to say is, I have not read the message, the response correctly, is it open on Sundays? So if you were to use a normal non-AI powered chatbot, it wouldn't have any idea what I'm asking it now because is what open on Sundays, but because we're using the context and it's understanding what's happened so far during the session. And it's just one like, yes, the Universal Library is open 24 seven, including Sundays. So it's actually picked up what I've asked for and modified the response accordingly, making it as human readable as possible. It's going to give us links where we can. So I'm going to keep asking how many like, and it's hard to type on the keyboard you're not used to. Library cooks, library books. And I check out. Apologies if I've got any spelling mistakes, but hopefully the bot should be able to handle that. So as a student, it knows I'm a student because I'm on the student page, it can do that. Can I check out DVD films? And again, it knows we're still talking about the library. So yeah, you can check out DVD films from the library. So we have a wide, so it's only pulled out the DVD selection of the FAQ, which is actually many paragraphs on this question, but it knows I'm only asking about the DVDs. So it's pulled that straight away. Uh, how do I get resources? Typo. Get resources that are not available in the library. So this is quite a complex query, really, because what I'm saying is I want to know about resources, but everything that's not the library, even though I'm talking about the library. 
hopefully it comes back, you can get our get it from me service to request resources. So it's picked that up as well. So there's not actually anything specific about get it from me is not library. It's pieced it all together by all those FAQs. We've got a question, Duncan. Yes. In the chat. Will it pick up on service updates? So if the library shut for maintenance, for example, the work, we would have to integrate that into the knowledge base somehow. So yeah, I'm going to touch about touch on the knowledge base in part three. Um, but yeah, we would just give it multiple feeds. So if there is a service update feed, we can access in real time, and the schedule task is running on a regular basis. Then yeah, for sure it would know. Okay, uh, just an example of small talk before I forget. Hi there. So if I just go off script, hi, how are you doing? So, um, and if at any point I say thanks, it should respond. So student service question, what I've got here, um, where can I go if I have personal difficulties that I want to discuss with someone? So I've completely changed the topic now. You can book a drop-in appointment. And so it's picked that up straight away. Um, I'm an international student now, so how do I collect my, is it BRP? I can't remember what it's called. Visas, a visa, sorry, from the university. Hopefully this isn't too boring. I'm me just typing in and asking the chatbot questions. There you go, if you applied. Um, so again, well, what about from the post office? I don't want to come to university, so. So let's pick that up. And what do I still talk about my visa? Oh, what do I do even if the digital status is wrong? So again, staying on that subject, but giving it quite a different bit of um, information to focus on. So if you believe there's a mistake, then that's what you do. So what it's doing, if I was to show you the knowledge base, those are the answers in the knowledge base. It's picking out and reformatting to make it as you know, the the uh, the open AI is trying to model it on our conversation and give us a more human flow to it. Uh, just a couple of student in administration. What is my Liverpool? We're going to get asked this a lot, I'm sure, because we're changing the name of it. What is my Liverpool, and how do I register? How and how do I register? Apologies for the lack of uppercase. So Liverpool Life is the university system for holding all your information. Did I type Liverpool Life on my Liverpool? All right, it's picked. So actually, it gave me a different answer before I was playing with this. Uh, how do I upload? How? I'm going to put all in. How do I upload my photo for my ID card? I've only got a couple more, and we're not going to be here all day, don't worry. There you go. So it's giving me all the information to upload your photo. So again, nothing to... Where do I get my card from? So this is, again, another tricky one. Because what does a card mean, you know, compared to all the information we've got in that FAQ system? We were talking about the student card, the ID card. So we'll interpret it as that. And it depends on the specific situation. So uh, just a couple more, and then I promise we're done. I'll get back onto the back end. So IT services, how do I connect to the university Wi-Fi? Why? I should have bought my keyboard from home. It's a lot easier. There you go. What we expect, how do... You want the same answer, but you can't bother writing that for questions, so you just put like Wi-Fi instructions on its own. Shall we? Okay. Yeah. My heart was beating there. <laughs> uh, how do I download? <laughs> Thank you. How do I download? office on my device. So for those at home who didn't hear, um, I was asked, could you just type in Wi-Fi instructions to simplify the amount of typing needed to be done? I so, imagine most students weren't saying, mm, right? And ask an actual question. 
Like Google search, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I agree 100%. How do I download Office on my device? So again, Office, does it know what Office means? And again, at no point have I said, I want to talk about IT services, I want to talk about accommodation. It's just, it's picking this up, it's interpreting from how we've trained it. And the last question, is Office free? And some FAQs will think you mean buildings and offices. And yes, yeah, so all staff and students, because we talked about office and downloading, it's put it all together. That's the end of the demo. So a little bit about the, the widget, just while we're here at any point. Oh, let's just rate it, it's good. You can leave a comment, that's cool. You can send yourself a transcript. So this is out of the box again. We may leave this in, we may take it off, depending on, on how the business wants to use it. Um, and you've got your standard emojis, and we can tailor these and customize these to put them as, as we wish. And if um, you are speaking to an agent, they might want you to upload something. You do have send a file or attach a screenshot, so they can be used. If the bot can't handle what you are asking and an agent steps in, they might say, can you send me a screenshot of what you're looking at? And, and we can go from there. Okay. Hopefully that was... It was enjoyable. We've got a lot of questions that you want to know at the end. Probably. Are they about can you ask it this and see if it works? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, how do I get to the chat? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that. oh sorry, the chat's just hidden here. That's right. Yeah, so if you make that bigger, um, that's it. And then scroll down. So the first one, we've answered one about the uh, live service update. So that one, Caroline's next. What happens if you ask it outside the bar? And what happens to ask if something outside the bot? Yes. So at the moment, it just says I can't answer that. It's just our default. Uh, we can tailor it so that if um, it's on a specific website, like my Liverpool, and you ask it something which it knows it shouldn't answer, it, we can prompt it to answer, to answer in, a, in, a, in a way the business wants. So it might be able to pick up on the intent and say, I, I can't deal with that. Please speak to your education team or or whoever. So yeah, we can, when we start putting the bot into the various places, the bots into the various places, we can tailor those responses. So we'll work with the subject matter experts or the the, uh, the staff responsible for those areas so that if it's on, if the bot's on, say, welfare, a welfare page, we might just want to constrain it to those questions. Great. And then Meg's next about uh, department uh, questions. Department. Yes, it will, Meg. I'll come on to that when I show you the knowledge base and what we plan to do with it moving forward. So on the topic of student support, is there some kind of warning system that notifies staff? Yeah, good question. So we have uh, been asked this many times. Yes, it's something we are looking at. Um, there's nothing out of the box currently, but what we can do is if we determine there are triggers, then we can put a mechanism in to send alerts, whether that be, we're, we're doing a lot more with SMS at the moment. So it might just be members of staff get an SMS alert rather than an email because they might respond to that a little bit quicker. But again, we will work with you, uh, with the business as a whole to understand how would we want to, to pick up on, on, on trigger discussions. Uh, would it give emergency contacts if a student was asking for help? Again, it's up to the business to decide. What we plan to do, I'm jumping ahead now, what we plan to do is open this as a beta quite soon and ask you to start testing it. We can show you the knowledge base. We can show you the questions it can handle and can't handle. And we want you to train it by using it, essentially. So yeah, but again, if that's something that's needed, then for sure, that's there. Will the bot be able to answer specific questions about the students themselves? Yes, I'll come up on that. Um, Mohammed, and a question, really good question, but yeah, that's one of the key things that we're aiming to build. Does it store the info? Yes, it does. Uh, and we can determine how long we want to keep it for. Depending on the nature of the conversation, the business might want a copy of that transcript um, for reasons. So yeah, we can do that. Um, there's no mechanism to make it readily available to staff currently. It might be a case-by-case -case basis. We don't know. We haven't really thought about that piece too much, but yeah, we do store it all currently. Are there fail-safes in place if someone tries to break the bot, i.e. to get confidential information out of the bot, or tells it to ignore previous instructions? Yes, very much. So I know it, um, if you've ever used ChatGPT, you can make it lie quite happily and you can convince it it's something it isn't. And I've seen many demos online of people almost getting into stand-up fights with, with ChatGPT. We can constrain it completely. If, it, if, if you start pushing it, we can tell it to stop. You know, so we, again, when you start using it, 
this is one of those systems where we've never built anything like this before. We don't know how people might use it. So we will work with you during a beta to make sure, you know, we'll want you to get angry with it and start asking it things it shouldn't be able to handle. And, and we can train it because that's what AI, AI does. Uh, can that bot, bot troubleshoot technical problems? Yes, it can very much. And I'm going to, thanks, Megan. I'm going to touch on that um, a little bit later. Will users of the bot be aware that they are not communicating with a real person? Isn't that the idea that they don't know they're communicating with a bot and they think they are? Um, it's a good question. One thing we have been asked by um, Gavin Brown and others is very much if you put in a trigger phrase, if the right live agent's present, if you say, I want to speak to somebody, please. If a live agent is there, it can say, I'll drop you down and you are now speaking to, and the person can then take over. So very much so. Yeah, I noticed someone mentioned the name Bella, which I agree with, it's a great name. We want it to be the bot. This is your bot here to help you with the understanding that where, when people are available, should the business um, have that set up, then they can take over and you, you can speak to a real-time person anytime you wish, if there is one or more available for you. Will the questions asked be monitored, reviewed? Yes, they are. Um, so we can look for patterns and I'll show you exactly why we're doing that towards the end, if that is okay. Great questions though, thank you. Hey, Sunday agrees, Bella Bot, yeah, all for it. Okay, um, hello, in the room. Um, on the note of data protection, and sort of, you said that the data is being stored currently and obviously people might ask quite personal questions. Similarly, is there, um, kind of an upfront statement about, like, mm. about this is a bot. Is there an upfront statement about this data is kept? Yeah, great question. So, for those at home, if you didn't hear the question, um, basically, with the is there an upfront statement about oh, well, well done, Rob. I thought someone else was typing that. Yeah, so is there an upfront statement, um, that everybody can read about what we are doing with the data and the data governance? Currently, no, because we're still building. There will very much be, there will be, um, a governance page somewhere online to say this is the bot this is what we are doing with the data um with a lot of the systems we build we follow gdpr ruling so we anonymize the data make it non-identifiable we will do that with this data if the business decides we want to store the data for x amount of time we can anonymize it immediately on request um that's all within our uh, within our domain but yes i imagine i i won't be writing it somebody else will someone in legal will write it for us um, and we'll make sure it's available for all. Um, will this, I think you already said this, but just to clarify, is this tool going to be available both online and like on the website from a laptop and also on the mobile app? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the goal. It will be. So we don't know for sure whether or not we'll go live with the My Liverpool bot first. Um, it, it, cover, it, it covers a massive area of information. And I think when I've demoed this previously, some people do get a little bit nervous about, you know, how do we how do we ensure it's answering questions correctly? And that's where we come back to the monitoring the the, the chats during the, the betas and whatnot. But yeah, very much so. We can we do plan to put it on. Our ultimate goal will be web and mobile, and on student student internet, internet okay. to start with. But we could take it everywhere. Okay. So yeah, I'll show you exactly how that will work moving forward. Okay, um, just aware of time, but thank you for the questions. If I go back to the presentation, let's move our chat. Okay, hopefully you can all see this again now. Are you moving? I never know if I've got focus. I lack focus. Okay, one thing I wanted to touch on. So this is just a screenshot I took yesterday. While I was typing the questions, when is the live open? Is it open on Sundays? Again, this is one I practiced, one I made yesterday. I've already practiced to make sure the answers were going to be okay. This is what a live agent would see. I haven't authenticated. I've just put my name and my email address in, but it knows where I was. Um, it knows my email address. It knows how long I've been using it for. And on the left-hand side, if there were multiple people using the bots, you could see those various chats and you could click in between them. Uh, the question was asked about authentication. I'll touch on that a little bit later, but if you stay on this screenshot right now, if you have authenticated, for example, into my Liverpool, we will pull that information in straight away. So we'll know your student, we'll know your student name, we'll know your ID, your email address by standard. We would then be able to go into our ID management system and pull out any relevant information, such as 
your year of study, the course you're taking, your exam results, your, I don't, the, you know, that's the beauty of IT services. We have access to a lot of data. How the business wants to use this, they can define it and work with us so that if the bot is on a specific page, and I know we mentioned um, teaching and learning materials earlier, we might want to pull in your previous modules, your current modules you're taking. We will be able to display that so that if you are an agent, you can have that information immediately in front of you. So you don't need to ask those same questions. Um, but yeah, just to give you a little screenshot of what that looks like, and we will do more demos on this when we when we make it a bit more, a little bit more meat on the bones. Okay, uh, where was I? So just a couple more slides. So this is kind of going on about like the future. So what where we are right now is we've built a very sophisticated chatbot using a finite set of data. But when we first started thinking about the chatbot, rather than building a specific chatbot that did one job very well, and that was all, what we thought was, what if we expanded it so that we could make a chatbot for everybody? So a single instance of a chatbot that we can place in multiple areas that can handle anything the university would need. Each instance could be placed on a web or a mobile app. The thing about the chatbot is it knows where it is. So if we place the chatbot on my Liverpool for the students, it knows it's on the student my Liverpool webpage. If we place it on a research specific mobile app, it knows it's in the research specific mobile app. So that's kind of key for the first part of the puzzle. The second part is it knows who you are, who you're if you're speaking to it, if you have authenticated into a system. So what we plan to do as we roll out this service, hopefully in the future, we will work with those um, application or website owners to understand how you authenticate into their apps or their websites. And we will integrate the chatbot into that mechanism so that if you've got, for example, a chemistry um, website, which just focuses on how you use chemistry equipment and you log into that, we will pull that through so we can get the information about the user interacting with the bot. And key here is it's powered by a single knowledge base. So the reason for that is we like the vector database. It's very, very fast at searching through massive amounts of data the way we've created it. There's three types of ways, three types of mechanisms, three mechanisms, sorry, to get your data into the database. Um, you can when we build the front end and give you access to it, you can add, enter questions and answers as we've done with the FAQ system. You will be able to do flat file uploads. So if you have, for example, training materials, um, so again, how do you use a complex piece of IT equipment? We can just upload that whole manual and it can pass it and pull that data out. Or we can uh, connect it up to secure APIs, um, our existing business systems we're looking at immediately, such as the timetable system. So that if a student asks, what I've got on tomorrow, you know, on my timetable, it can just pull that information through. So they are the three ways. And we think with those three methods, we can cover hopefully everything that you'd ever want to um, to do to get data into the chatbot. So as I mentioned, data is key just to really um, simplify how the database works. These are the, the columns, for want of a better word, when it comes to relational databases. This is what we're looking at. So everything needs to have a title. So it knows the topic area, uh, the body of the data. So whether that's manual entry, file upload, API. And then we use dates for the um, vector of data. So start date, end date, amended dates, and review dates. So if an end date is there and it passes, it will drop out of the chat. So if you want some information to be relevant just for a small amount of time, you can put an end date and it will, it will drop out as soon as that end date passes. Um, and we can put review dates in, that's what we've done so far, is so that we might want to remind you, it's been a year, can you just look at your data, please make sure it's up to date, so that the system can be as automated as possible. Uh, there'll be one or more subject matter expert who is the owner of each of the data. This is key, we don't want this all to be IT data at all. We want this to be your data, your chatbot, yours to, to govern and use as you need. Um, We've got a simple validation, so we can just invalid unvalidate um, data immediately. And again, that will just drop out. So it's an easy way of removing bulk data out. But the last two are key, categories and audiences. So categories um, 
allow us to restrict the data based on the application. So that is where the bot is. So if we want it to be just my Liverpool data, we can give it the my Liverpool category. If we wanted it to be the chemistry equipment data, then we give it the chemistry equipment data category. And then the audience. So they are attributes which we can define ourselves to say who can access that data. So if you're a chemistry student, for example, you might access chemistry equipment data, but a math student wouldn't. And again, it's up to the business to, to work with us to decide how it wants to put those attributes together. So uh, some of the matching data we've already looked at is year, year of study, that should say, typo, year of study. Maybe it was year of study. Uh, so year of study, your department, your school, your faculty, you might have specific data for those. If you're international, if you're UK-based, but really any other university requirements, anything we can identify you by, we can use to make up your categories and your audience types. So I've got three more slides, and this is, um, I've touched on a lot of this, but scenarios, just to give you a flavor of what this bot will be able to do in the future, if all goes well. So scenario one, I am a first year student logging into the My Liverpool system. So when I ask the bot, what lectures do I have today? So the bot knows you've requested this via My Liverpool. So it lives on My Liverpool. It will only search the valid My Liverpool specific data sets. Everything else will be excluded. It knows you are a student X, you've authenticated, you've logged in. We know all your details. The bot's actions, it determines the topic being asked. It identifies that this is likely to come from a timetable API. It passes the username to the API and the relevant information in the, in the message, such as today. And then it returns the data set and displays this in a human readable form. So the students, if they've forgotten what lectures they've got on today, they can just type in, what are my lectures today? And it gets it. So we've not had to type that into a knowledge base. We will just connect up to the timetable API and allow my Liverpool to search for it. Two more, scenario two. The prospective student visits our main website and it asks the bot a very general question related to some university information, i.e., can you give me more information on a course, please? The bot knows it's living on the main website and there's no authentication, so it only searches the valid general URL data sets as we define. It excludes everything else. It doesn't know anything about the person it's talking to, except for the name and email address if we want to ask for that. Similarly, it determines the topic being asked. It identifies the data sets it's likely to come from. And it returns that data set in a human readable form. And depending on the amount of data coming back, it can add links if needed, if that link, if those links exist elsewhere. So it might be able to point the user to a specific course page on, on the main university website. And the final one, scenario three, I've got a second year history student. You can see where this is going. Second year history student who's logged into Canvas and we've placed the bot on into Canvas. And the student asks the bot a specific question related to a specific module or some specific course content. It knows it's on Canvas and knows where to search. So it'll probably only search those data sets which encompass teaching materials. Everything else will be excluded. It knows who the student is and knows from our ID system everything about them. It knows it's a history student, so it knows which modules a history student is on currently. And so we can really narrow down that search. It determines the intent or the topic being asked. It identifies that we're probably going to pull this from an education API or similar. It'll pass the username, the year, the course, the module, everything that's needed to that API, and then it will return the data sets and hopefully the correct answer in a human readable form. So one, um, one thing we would ask was um, when we started talking about this, staff find it very hard to find information from the HR website. So if you need to find a specific policy, you know, for example, how long is paternity leave now? This is where the power of the bot will really come in that we can just point it to the HR data sets and say, answer the question. Uh, okay, one more slide, the My Liverpool chatbot. Why did we decide to use this first? So those two tables you can see here, 
they are the queries that came in at the start of the last academic year for the first four weeks. So we had almost 6,000 queries from new students and returning students based on those topics. So we decided to give it the information that's in the existing My Liverpool FAQ, Student Handbook, and uh, information knowledge base articles from ServiceNow. So that's our main knowledge base. And the goal would be to reduce that number down. So, you know, we've not set any limits on ourselves, but if we can reduce it from 6,000 down to 3,000, you can imagine just how much time and money that's saving with regards to staff hours and the ability for those members of staff to focus on the more important um, issues that the students are facing and less on those repetitive, um, what we call more simple, <laughs> simple issues that the, the bot should be able to handle. And that is the end of the presentation. Hopefully that was okay. So um, any questions in the room or on the chat, I'll open up the chat window again, if that's okay. Caroline, Caroline, how do we have to test this? Caroline, thank you. Um, we will let you know via CIE channels, via the our own IT um, service newsletter. And if you've not signed up for that, here's a plug, please sign up for our IT service newsletter. You will be heard about it first there. I imagine. Um, but yeah, it's key. We want as many people as possible to test this. The more you test it, the more it trains and learns. We can get more accurate responses and we can also see maybe where it's not as strong. Um, this is our first endeavor into the AI world. It's quite daunting, but it's very exciting. The more people we can have using it, the better. And the idea is we will not hit the start of academic year. We need to show um, the business that it can be 100% confident that the bot is behaving the way we, we wish it to be. Uh, will it be able to direct students to certain places on campus if location services are enabled? Good question. Yes, no reason why we shouldn't. So we have a point of interest API. That's how we do all our building, all our mapping data. So we will be able to incorporate that in the future to say, you know, how do I get to? Or um, especially we're really focusing on um, accessibility when it comes to the building data. So, you know, does building X have an accessible entrance? Those are the questions we really want to make sure it can answer. Does it have accessible features? Yes, it does, Steve. Um, we've not really looked into that too much yet, but that is, 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 is on our plan. We know it is um, fully integrated into um, voice software so that if you are not somebody who um, uses a keyboard and use um, voice to uh, chat, then they can do that. Okay, uh, Ruby, if someone wants to update information that exists on the website, they need to submit those updates to the web team that manages information as well as to the chatbot. Uh, we haven't defined this yet. So again, this is just our own data we're looking at. When we come to, to roll the chat out further afield, we will work with you to um, to understand what is best, You know how to make it as simple and as um, efficient as possible. I imagine um, what we are not planning to do is to scrape information from the website. So what we don't want to do is just say chatbot, look at the web and do what you want. When we've done that kind of thing in the past, it's not been a great experience, but it's something we might do in the future. But yeah, we will work with you when we come to, to look to put the chatbot elsewhere. We'll, we'll agree what's the best way forward for that. Uh, will a bot link to the library LibAnswers FAQ system? No reason why it shouldn't. Not something we looked at yet, but if there's an API we can we can hook into, then yes, we will do that. Um, does it know to ignore unpublished materials? Could a student ask what are the exam questions if they are on there? <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be that would be dangerous. Um, it's up to you to define how the knowledge base is um, set up and works. So if you wanted published materials only, then you'd say, these are the materials I want you to access. Yeah, we'd need to do, if we were hooking into, for example, an exam question API, then we'd need to fully understand the makeup of that API and that certain um, values or certain criteria are to be ignored. You know, the thing about AI is it's not intelligent. It does what you tell it to do. You just give it a bit more leeway at times. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, Canvas has a built-in API with this clash. We don't know if we'll ever put this into Canvas. That was just a hypothetical scenario. If for some reason we remove the AI from Canvas, we could use our own. Um, 
in theory, they should work hand in hand, but I don't know much about the Canvas AI myself. Okay, students have sent lots of emails and Canvas announcements with information and instructions that they don't always digest. Could these be easily plugged into the bot so they can ask questions? Yeah, of course they can. Um, yeah, Megan, again, great question. This is up to us to define. You know, we can create a an announcement feed that can be, you know, timestamped to so say, right, look at the announcement feed for the last X amount of days so that if a student answers, ask, ask a question which is relevant, then then use this information. Again, it's all it's up to us to define. That's that's the potential is all there. If email sent to students are CC to the bot. Could that feed it? Um, not quite, but we could build something along those lines for sure. Hello, I've just got a question in the room. Hi. Um, hi, that was great. Thank you. That's Thank a lot you. of work, I can imagine. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have, um, and I don't know how expensive, like energy expensive these chatbots are, but do you and your team have a sustainability plan going forward? Because I can imagine you can get a lot of data businesses going for a few years and staff and students both using it. Yeah, it's a great, great question. So the question was about sustainability and how we make sure, you know, we're not spending too much energy or too much money on this. Um, yeah, we do have sustainability tools that we use with every application we build, whether it's web or mobile, so we can see the cost of use. Um, what we are planning to do, one thing which I probably didn't touch on fully is we are not sending data to the cloud. We are not sending it to ChatGPT to store as their own data. We're keeping it all local. What the bot can do if it's asked a question, it remembers so that if a student asks that same question, it doesn't have to search for it. And we can contain the, or we can constrain it as much as we feel is needed, or we can say after X amount of time, search again. Um, so yeah, what we can do is give the business a running total for this is the amount of energy the bot is using, this is the cost it's cost, you know, it is with regards using the AI or using our own services. So we. We do get asked that a lot. It's like, how much do these things cost to run? And um, and is it is it worth our while? Yeah, so I'm aware the kind of data storage infrastructure at Liverpool isn't perfect in terms of like active and cold storage. And yep. stuff, so I'm just wondering if you Yeah, I think we'll be okay. It's all stored in vectors, so we can store on a lot of data and what, and what we have in place. Um, but it is finite. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Uh, if you think of something afterwards, just contact me via email. I think I had it briefly, so oh, let me minimize that. So yeah, my email address, Steve Brown. Thank you for your time, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that, and hopefully you'll hear more from our bots soon. So yeah.